Hey guys and gals. My name is Ryan. In case you don't know me, I come here at the church, and uh, of course, Pastor Doug's still uh, in big, in Florida, enjoying the sunshine. I'm sure with his family and everything. And uh, Brian asked me if I would uh, share tonight. Now I have to tell you, you know, for me, I'm a, I'm a radio guy, and I love to share on the radio behind a microphone when nobody can see me. So this is a little foreign concept to me. So, but you know, at the same time, I'm excited because uh, there's, there's something about God's word that can just really inspire us, motivate us, give us some hope, give us direction. And we're going to do that tonight. We're going to jump in here. But first of all, I want you to take a look at the screen. There's a, there's a picture up here I want to show you. Now, if you're a Boston sports fan, that's uh, a pretty iconic picture from this past summer when the Boston Celtics won the championship, right? Yeah. Of course, if you're a Boston sports fan like me, that's kind of, you know, gets you energized and everything. But to be honest with you, until uh, I saw a picture of that, I totally forgot that they had won. You know, it's kind of one of those things where in the moment, that's kind of exciting. Same thing with uh, you probably as a parent, you still have a lot of this hanging around at home, right? Uh, just a lot of candy hanging out at home, uh, especially if you have teenagers, grandkids, uh, or big kids. You know, if you love candy, there's probably a lot of that hanging out at home. And you're like, what are we going to do with all this? We're in November now. And then, of course, we all know what happened yesterday. And it wasn't just yesterday, but it was a, it was a long year leading up to that. So... So the title for tonight, when the sugar high wears off, then what? It's kind of like, you know, when the Celtics won the championship or your favorite sports team wins like something. It's like, yeah, they won. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, but I still have to get up in the morning and go to work. Or you eat all this candy and then you feel guilty after and then you get all energized and the sugar wears off. It's like, okay, I have to get on a diet real quick. <laughs> There's a, there a passage in Scripture that I kind of landed on. I, the way I'm going to approach tonight, by the way, you know, I'm not a preacher, but uh, I do like to share, you know, what God's been showing me, and maybe we can go along this journey tonight. Is that cool? Um, and it's so funny, too, because when I came in here today, I was thinking about, all right, God, what do you want to speak tonight? And then I was kind of putting together some, some notes over the past few days in my mind, and then all of a sudden today, God's like, nope, <laughs> you're going to go in this direction. So this all happened today, and uh, I'm glad he did that because that's how God does it, right? He speaks in ways that uh, he, wants, he wants to show us tonight. So we're going to actually land tonight in First Peter chapter 1. We're going to actually gonna read the whole chapter, and then we're just going to kind of go through uh, verse by verse uh, what he has in store. But let's pray and ask him to... Uh, Show his word to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for the worship, God. Wow. It's so awesome, God, just to gather together in your house, gather together with your people, just to sing these anthems to you, God, as an offering. God, thank you for just these reminders to trust in you and at the cross, what you've done for us. And God, we just take our heart and just say, here's our heart, God. It's yours. So God, as we open up your word tonight, let it be just a revelation in our minds and our hearts of what you're doing today, God, and just how you spoke through Peter and just how people receive that, God. So we just pray for just your wisdom here tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm actually going to uh, read from the New Living Translation. So that's just a version that I'm kind of cool with it. And I think I, I actually got this version up here. So I'm going to read it. Let's just read it through, and then uh, we'll just kind of look at it. So this is uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. The letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. 
All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all of you to see. So be truly glad there is a wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong, there are many trials. It will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him, and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. Then they were told that their messengers, messages were not themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. So prepare your minds for action. Exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't even know better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during the time here as temporary residence. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it is not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So, now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. And as the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. Whew, that's a lot. That's a lot of good stuff there. And there's a lot of stuff we're probably not going to unpackage tonight, but just what a, what a chapter because it just so depicts the hope of Christ that was given for you and I. It was given for all of us. And, you know, it, he kind of talks about the, in this letter when Peter wrote this letter. And when he wrote this letter, he wrote it to a very specific group of people. You know, he wrote it to a people who are in exile. You know, people who are kind of wandering, you know, kind of scattered out and dispersed. And you kind of think about a situation where people are like, well, if they're kind of wandering over here and, you know, we're just under persecution over here, you know, this is his encouragement just to say, you know what, this is why you're living your life. This is what Christ has done for you. And this Peter, you know, when he wrote this, 
he wrote this to the Roman provinces of Asia Minor. You know, just a little backstory on this. And it was intended to be passed on to the churches in that reason, region. So this letter would be passed around so people would be encouraged by that. So, you know, kind of going back to uh, verse 1, you know, he wrote it to certain people, you know, and then looking at verse 2, I, I love this line in verse 2. It says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy as a result you obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. God the Father knew you and cho chose you long ago. When we obey God, you know, it's an intentionality, right? It's an intentionality in our attitude, in our mind, in our heart to say, okay, God, I know you're speaking. And what are we going to do with that? Are we going to be like, no, God, I'm not going to, that, that's a little uncomfortable for me. That's my, not my wheelhouse. I'm just going to kind of walk over here a little bit. No. Obeying God requires the Holy Spirit in us to recognize that he is all powerful God, right? And so we need the Holy Spirit when we obey God. We need the Holy Spirit to speak to us. How do we do that? We, we pray, right? We seek him out. We read his word. You know, that's how the Holy Spirit really works in us. You know, in verse 3, you know, all praise to God. It is by his great mercy we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Just like Christy sang that song, At the Cross. That's, that's what Christ did for us. And that line, now we live with great expectation. Great expectation. I mean, that's, that's a cool line in Scripture. Great expectation. You know, if, you, if you're a parent, you have young kids, you know, Christmas morning, kids get up early. Now, I was one of those kids when I grew up. And I'm going to date myself a little bit. But when I grew up with my brother, uh, this thing called the Nintendo came out. This is back in 1984. Okay, 1984, a little, little while back. And this was like the biggest thing. And so for Christmas, that's what we wanted. It's like we had this expectation that, you know, Christmas morning, we're going to get this new Nintendo. We we're kind of peeking underneath the Christmas tree, days leading up to Christmas. We're like, yeah, we don't see a box big enough that would hold a Nintendo. So it's like, okay, but we're hoping, hoping, hoping. Christmas morning, we woke up, we saw this big green box in the middle of the floor with a tiny green box on top of it. And me and my brother were like, like sprinting to that box. We had that expectation, like, yeah, we're going to get this Nintendo for Christmas, right? And I, I tried to find the photo, but there was a photo of me and my brother. He was like, and I was like doing this over the wrapping paper, ready to like rip this thing to shreds because of that expectation. I was like, this is what we're going to get. Sure enough, we got the Nintendo. That expectation was like, wow, we got it. Sometimes, you know, I think as Christians, we kind of don't have that wow factor. You know, I'm speaking for myself. It's like, we know God is real. We know he's sovereign. He's almighty. We're facing this giant situation in our lives. What expectation do we have that he is above anything that you and I can face? And I just love that we can live with great expectation. You know, God blesses you and I with so much, right? You know, every spiritual blessing that we can ever imagine. And he came to earth for us. And, you know, when Paul went on to describe the blessings, you know, emphasizing the fact that every spiritual blessing has been given, and he did it with us in mind, right? He did it with us in mind. And there's a, there's a, a great verse next in verse 4. It says that we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. There's a picture I want you to put up there, Brian, of a guy. Anybody know who this is? Nobody knows, right? Nobody knows who this is? His name is Mark Majewitz. He is Austria's, Austria's richest person and wealthiest millennial in the world. 30 years old, he inherited 49%, almost $37, million, $37 billion of Red Bull that his father owned, who passed away in 2022. He inherited that much. Next slide. This, Francois Betancourt Meyer, she's a granddaughter, and she is a second person in the world who had the second largest inheritance. She received 
almost $50 billion from L'Oreal, from her family. And she's in her 70s now, and she's worth like $77.5 billion. She had that much of an inheritance. Last one. This lady here is Julia Koch. She inherited $61 billion when her husband passed away who owned Koch Industries. That's a pretty lofty inheritance, right? I bet you didn't know who these people were when you saw their faces. I didn't until I looked it up. I was like, okay. But those three were the top three individuals who had the biggest inheritances. It's one of those things where it's like, wow, you know, what do you do with all that money, right? But here's the thing. God gave you and I such an incredible inheritance, you know, outlined in, in verse 4. And uh, over in Romans, I didn't put this up there, Brian, but uh, Romans 8.15, it says, So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his children. Now we call him Abba, Father. And, you know, that, that's such a personal God, you know, where we can call him Abba, Father, our dad, daddy. You know, and it kind of gives you that, that reflection of his warmth and closeness to us, that he wants a relationship with us. And, you know, when Peter, you know, when Peter was writing to the Christians, you know, a lot of people realized that he realized they were going through a lot of persecution. They were in exile. They were just kind of looking for direction. And they were suffering, right? You know, they were like, you know, we have to escape. We, we don't know where to go, but we know our faith is strong. But this is one thing that he recognized is that as children of God, our inheritance can never be lost. And he wanted to encourage people in this letter, say, you know, you have an inheritance that can't be lost. Nobody can take it away. Nobody can destroy it. You know, when you have all this money, right, you know, people can steal it. You know, you could, somebody could just take it away. You could buy all these wonderful things and then it could be gone. But this is an inheritance that nobody can steal. Nobody can take away. It can't be broken. This is an inheritance that God has given us. Verse 5, And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. You know, I just love that line, by his power, because it just reminds us that God, he's all sovereign, he's all knowing. It's through his power that we are able to have the Holy Spirit in us. And he's always working on our behalf. And that's the cool thing about our God. He is such a personal God. You know, have you ever prayed for something? You're like, oh God, I've been praying for this. I've been praying for this. I've been praying for this. And I just don't sense a yes from you. And you keep waiting and you keep waiting. And then if you're like me, it gets a little frustrating at times. <laughs> but it's like when we pray and pray and pray, it's like, okay, God, what's, what's going on here? He's working on our behalf. Sometimes he answers yes. Sometimes he answers no. And a lot of the times he'll say wait. And uh, that could be the hard thing sometimes. But know that he has his best purpose in mind. Verse 6. So be truly glad. That could be tough if you're praying and praying and praying and waiting for breakthrough, right? But be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. You know, Peter, he, when he wrote this... Uh, I would suspect that he recognized that a lot of the people he was writing to were grieving. You know, they were distressed, you know, going through so many trials, you know, in the moment. And yet, I would say he probably assumed that they were rejoicing in the reality that they had that eternal life. And, you know, the Bible says, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. What does that really mean? I think rejoicing, I think sometimes we twist this around a little bit. You know, I can, I can be guilty of this too, but, you know, rejoicing, I think it's less about feelings, how we feel about something, you know, because I think, you know, oh, we need more joy, we need more joy, we need that emotion. I think it's less about that, and it, it's more about faith, our faith, right? And just maintaining some sort of emotional state, that's not, that's not a steady ground. But to me, it's more about a declaration. When we say rejoice, I want to rejoice in the Lord. We're declaring who he is and what he's done for us. Nothing can change that. We can rejoice. 
We all go through trials. We all go through stuff, right? Verse 7, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fires test and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. You know, it's funny too. I, was, uh, I went on YouTube earlier today, and it's pretty fascinating. Have you ever seen how gold is refined? You know, the process of gold, how it's refined? It's pretty fascinating how they take this raw gold that miners, you know, and gold uh, miners find, and they have to really reduce it down to get rid of some of the impurities. There's such a big process with it. And if you ever see it, you know, look it up on YouTube. It's really, really fascinating how they do that. But I think about, that's what God's doing with us. That's what he's doing with us. He's refining us for, for his purpose and for his glory. And, you know, when we face those trials, those are moments where we could be like, okay, God, this doesn't feel good right about now, but he's letting us go through those moments so we could be more refined for him. So, I mean, what fire are you going through right now? I, have, I could name three, four things I'm going through right now that it's like, okay, God, this is not fun. What are some of the fires that you're going through right now? And how are you coping with that? You know, what is our response to that? And I think that's such a good question to ask. In verse 8, you love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and rejoice with a glorious inexpressible joy. As he's refining us, we got to trust the process. When we pray and we're asking God, God, I need a breakthrough with this health issue. God, I need a breakthrough through this marriage issue. God, I need a breakthrough through my finances. He lets us go through things to refine us, to trust, to lean in, to press in a little bit deeper with him so he can refine us and say, you know what? I still have you. I haven't left you, but this is for a purpose. And there's great reward in that, isn't it? I mean, there's so much reward in that. We don't see it in the moment, but you kind of look back. It's like, well, okay, God, I kind of see what you did there. You know, I was telling a friend I said, who was going through a really tough time a few months ago. We prayed. God was opening those doors. I said, journal what you're doing, what you're going through. And looking back, we had a conversation recently. Looking back, it's like, wow, God actually did something really, really cool. So, you know, journaling is something I always recommend doing, writing stuff down, because you can always look back and say, God, you did come through in that situation. Thinking about, so going to verse 10, this salvation was something that even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about the gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. The salvation of God's grace wasn't new to Peter or really the other apostles who followed Jesus. But you think about those in the Old Testament, some of the old heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. These men respected the readers, but they wanted to realize that these prophets themselves, they didn't really fully understand fully the whole puzzle, the whole picture of what God had given them. And you know, even though they knew full well they were missing parts of the puzzle, the prophets, they were inspired by the one thing that you and I have today, and that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that gives us wisdom and guidance. The Holy Spirit of God wrote of God's coming grace for those of Peter's time. So when Peter wrote this letter, when this letter was written, it was just, you know, to offer some hope for people who are in exile. But I love the second part of this, this book where it's more of a call for holy living. And so verse 13, it starts out, prepare your minds for action. So he kind of set it up saying, this is what Christ has done for us. We have the Holy Spirit available to us, but now what do we do with it? So prepare your minds for action, exercise self-control, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. It's a choice. It's a deliberate choice that you and I have to make. And sometimes when we go through things, it's like, how do I prepare my mind for the day when I have to deal with this over here and this distraction over here? Oh, I'm going to church and these people are mad at me over here. Or I have to go to this job and my boss is breathing down my neck over here. How do you prepare your minds for that? 
to exercise self-control sometimes and putting our hope in, in God, you know, when everything seems to come at us. So you must live as God's obedient children. Verse 14, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. I have to laugh because when I was a kid, for whatever reason, I would love to touch hot things. And my parents were like, what are you doing? Stop doing that. Anytime something like on the stove was hot, I had to put my hand next to the stove and just feel how hot it was. Or if the fireplace was going, I had to like get my hand so close without burning it. I'm like, oh, I want to feel that. I want to feel that. Until my brother saw me kind of do that, and then he pushed my hand against the stove, and I burned my hand pretty bad. And he got in trouble, <laughs> serious trouble for that. But it's one of those things, like as a child, it's like, obviously, being a kid, my parents say, don't do that, but I did it anyway. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, I was reading this verse in verse 14. It's like we didn't know any better then, you know, before we knew Christ. It's like me as a kid trying to touch hot things like as a kid. I don't know any better. Even though I did, I'm like, I know this is probably not a good idea. But, you know, even as adults now, when we know that we have faith in Jesus, you know, we know because of the Holy Spirit that lives in us how he wants us to live, how he wants us to respond in obedience when things come our way. You know, everyone who's in Christ is a believer. And, you know, Peter calls us obedient children in Scripture. Literally, children of obedience. Verse 15, but now we must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. That is not easy sometimes, especially coming off a day like yesterday. And, uh, you know, I was out yesterday morning, went to the town did my civic duty, and, you know, I was so encouraged to see a lot of people out yesterday. I'm like, this is good. You know, people are, are taking action, however you choose to go. And I saw a lot of conversations and even a lot of arguments in the community. I'm like, just walk away, just walk away. And sometimes, you know, you want to respond to things, but sometimes you just got to not do that and just walk away being holy in everything we do. That can be tough sometimes. And I think you see things on Facebook, you're like, oh, I got to respond right away. Or somebody says something at church or whatever, and it's like, oh, yeah, I got I to respond that way. And it's like, what are we doing? You know, we have to be called to a higher standard. Holy in everything we do. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. But God who chose you is holy, and he has provided a great example for you and I to live. He says in verse 16, the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Verse 17, remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. That's, That's sobering, right? You know, for a lot of us. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Can I tell you, you know, I, I've been working in ministry for 26 years, and just seeing people that you encounter in the community, and we'll take Waterville, for example, you know, people in Waterville. When you share or try to do something good in the name of Jesus for someone, people are like, oh, God, you know, God will strike me dead, or, you know, I, I don't want to step foot in the church because, you know, I've lived this life and everything. And they have this fear of God, like a fear of like, God, you know, that kind of fear. But when it says here, you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. We're just passing through. This is not the end game. Praise God for that, right? This life is not the end game. But that reverent fear, yes, our Father does love us. He does judge He judges our works. He pays attention to whether we're living as holy people set apart for his purposes or whether we are driven by evil motives and desires. And I'm guilty of it at times. It's like, okay, that probably wasn't a good choice. You know? 
But that's where the Holy Spirit, that's where that refining takes place, when he convicts us, shows us, tells us that we got to do better, do better for him. You know, and stop convincing ourselves and the world around us that we belong here. This is not the end game. This is not our temporary, this, this is not our permanent home. This is just a temporary destination. And I just love that reminder of verse 17 that we're just temporary residents. So yeah, living in fear, it's a healthy fear. It's that reverent fear. It's like, God, you're all big. You're all sovereign. You're all knowing. Thank you for the purpose you've given in me. Thank you for the purpose you've given in each of us because of what your son did for us. That's that reverent fear to say, you are holy. I'm a sinner, but you saved me through your grace and mercy. And that's, that's the reverent fear that we should you know, strive after. Verse 18, for we know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. You know, we're heading into the holiday season where we celebrate the birth of Christ. And, you know, with Easter we celebrate what he's done for us, you know, on the cross and how he defeated death. And that's, that's the hope. But sometimes I feel like when Easter is all over and we put away all the Easter things and spring is coming, summer's coming, so okay, hey, no, Easter's done. Easter service is great. I had hundreds of people in church. Just kind of move on from that. But I love in this letter in First Peter how he reminded those who are wavering and in exile, persecuted. This is our God, what he's done for you and I. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. Verse 21, you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead, gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever becomes from the eternal living word of God. You know, Peter, he put a charge out here. You know, put out like a call to action to love each other deeply. Because you have people who are in exile, they're being persecuted. It's so easy to say, you know, I'm being persecuted right now. It's hard to say, okay, I'm going to put that aside. And, oh, yeah, I'm going to love my neighbor as I encounter people. Because you kind of hold on to that. Persecution is not fun right? Especially if you're a Christian in the workplace, you're a Christian at your school, you're a Christian out in the community when you're at Hannaford and you see things going on and maybe you want to share your faith and maybe you just encourage someone and they're like, no, I'm good. Thank you. And they just kind of walk away and they feel like, oh, that was not fun. Or maybe someone, maybe your boss or a teacher or they ridicule you because you are a follower of Jesus. That's not a fun feeling. But knowing that you are a child of the one true king, he has you. And sometimes when you're persecuted, Scripture is very clear. We will be persecuted. And I think about, you know, the persecution in biblical days. It was life and death. That was life and death persecution. So to have someone that we know or encounter say, you know, you're a Christian. No, I'm going to make fun of you. That is such a a scratch compared to the persecution that, we see here. And we think about the persecution, right? Even some of the missionaries that this church supports, you know, in different countries, they can't openly express in some places what you and I get to do here tonight, sitting in these chairs. And when we leave this building, we get to go out and share our faith and live our faith out loud in our community. So persecution is real. Sometimes we feel like, oh, persecution is terrible here and you know, I don't like it, you know, uh, just all the things that are going on here in the state and in our country. You think about what these people went through, my goodness, we don't really fully understand what persecution is at times. And as the scripture said, and I love this, you know, it kind of goes along with um, the scripture where it says that this is not our temporary, this is our temporary residence. But verse 24, it says, as the scriptures say, people are like grass, Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And, 
you know, verse 25, when it says, but the word of the Lord remains forever, it's actually Peter's quote from Isaiah 40, where in uh, 40 verses 6 through 8, where Isaiah's poem described the glorious field of flowering grass that quickly withers and dries up. And it's a picture of human existence, right? You know, we're here, we're born, we live a life that God has given us for his purpose, his plan, his glory. And then we're going to expire here, but we're going to spend an eternity with him. And it seems brief, but eternity is going to be so much greater, right? And by contrast, the word of the Lord remains forever. We may come and go this side of eternity, but God's truth remains the same. And Peter, he had made that case in this letter. And it was revealed to the people that read it, the churches that passed around this letter who read it. Specifically, the good news, that first part where it was the hope, right? This is the hope that we have. And that's Jesus Christ, what he's done for us and the Holy Spirit that indwells in us. So when Peter wrote this, it's for us too. So for us to hold on to that hope, believe it, live it, Word of God remains forever. He is the active living Word of God. And we can live forever believing in that and placing our faith in Christ. So just to wrap up, I hate politics. <laughs> I, I don't like politics. Um, but we just had an election. And today is Wednesday. And there's people in our country, people in our towns, people in our city who are either super happy or super bummed out. People who are extremely hopeful or hopeless. There are people who are uh, joyful. There are people who are super fearful. You're probably in one of those camps tonight. I think it's fair to say. But this is what I know. And this is where we really get to grasp this concept that God is still on the throne. He is the same yesterday. He's the same today. He is the same forever. His purposes, his plans always prevail. Always. He's the ruler. He's the authority. He's our hope. And so... There's no politician, no government, no town counselor, no governor, no president, no senator, no world leader that can fix our problems. They can make problems, but they're not going to fix our problems. And certainly none of them can bring the final answer. Remember that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Is that your final answer? None of them can bring the final answer. He is the final answer because of what this says, his holy word. So... When the sugar high wears off, the day after the election day, when the sugar wears off after you eat all that Halloween candy, all these things that you encounter, those high God moments, and then sugar high wears off, how do you respond when trials come? Our faith is going to be persecuted. It's, it's going to happen. How do we respond to that? We obey God, number one. We ask the Holy Spirit to work, work within us because it's real. It's living within us. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. And trust he is always working on our behalf because he is faithful. He is faithful and just. And I think another great way to respond, no matter how you're feeling today, no matter what you're going through, we're all going through stuff, right? A great response is to worship. It's such a great response. Getting into his word, pray together. We, we'll do that at the end. We'll split up in groups. We'll pray at the end. But a great response to God is to worship. And so I've asked Christy if uh, she would come back up and uh, have a couple songs. Well, we just worship tonight because he is good. He is faithful. So, Father, we thank you.